what, what really happened as a result of the financial crisis is that while they still paid lip service to inflation targeting, okay? I mean, they still say that they're doing it. In actual fact, the evidence in terms of the actual reaction functions, if you sort of model that and try to see how exactly, you know, we, we looked at that, uh, you will see that they're not doing that. My name is Mario Sicareccia. I'm a full professor at the Department of Economics at the University of Ottawa. What is inflation targeting? Uh, it's, it's based on this, I mean, this is, it's within a framework of analysis that became popular uh, in the 1990s, really. It started, in fact, the whole idea of inflation targeting, I think it almost came as an accident. In, it started in New Zealand in, in the late 80s when they were going through some sort of currency crisis problems. And the government at the time wanted to do what they've always done, you know, when they want to implement sort of austerity type policies, which is to uh, seek to control, you know, wage growth in the public sector. And somebody got the bright idea, almost you could say here, I mean, uh, to why don't we do something a little bit different, get the central bank to announce a target for the inflation rate, which could then be emulated, so to speak, by, you know, by whoever, you know, who are negotiating. And, and if, if there's enough credibility in that, you know, target, they will, in fact, you know, uh, follow through. Uh, and it started that way. In fact, it's akin to what I, we call incomes policies. Now, I'm going to get to that in a minute, what this really means. But as I said, the whole idea of an inflation target is to be able to uh, control now by announcement alone, an emulation effect within the labor market side primarily, okay, uh, which is the prime focus usually. Uh, and more importantly also is that if, for whatever reason, it is not sufficiently credible, okay, then the central bank has another tool. If the carrot sort of doesn't work so well, then you will perhaps use the stick. And the stick, of course, is a blunt kind of instrument called interest rate policy. In other words, the central banks are able to raise interest rates to slow down the economy somewhat, and in the process, try to achieve that target inflation rate. Okay? So uh, this, of course, is uh, interesting because, as you can see here, uh, through the cost side, it impacts on, you know, on business behavior and ultimately on their decision as to whether or not they will accept, you know, whatever, you know, uh, in, in their negotiations, let's assume here, if there is a kind of trade union relationship or not here, but in some sort of negotiation with their employees, if they will uh, be able to, you know, get that target down. And uh, it's interesting, though, that it is done in a kind of weird way, which is that you wish to deflate, so to speak, you wish to control the income growth of one group by suppressing it, so to speak, somewhat, by, on the other hand, raising the incomes of some other group who are the interest income earners here, in a sense. So it's a kind of weird way of doing things, you would think. But it is a, a, a fundamentally an incomes policy in that regard. In fact, this is a passe term. There used to be a time when, as you know, uh, if you go back in the U.S., for instance, in the 1960s under Kennedy-Johnson period, they had these guideposts. Now, these guideposts were essentially the same thing. They would announce specific goals that, you know, that hopefully, again, if they had enough credibility, then those who were involved in, in negotiations or whatnot would in turn be able to you know, emulate, you know, follow through, and have an impact on, on the inflation rate at the end. Okay? So this is not a, a new idea. What is different is that in the old days, in terms of incomes policies, what they did had to justify it on certain grounds. Okay? So just to give an example, 
uh, in Canada, we used to have the, uh, we had an anti-inflation board, which they had literally compulsory types. Now these, we've had, you know, historically there's been different types, like guidelines or guideposts, you know, uh, which we had as well in the late 60s, early 70s. Then they had, like in the US, they had the Nixon kind of, uh, you know, incomes policy types, which were uh, compulsory. Uh, in Canada, we had in the mid to late 70s, we had compulsory types of incomes policies, okay? which basically what they did, and it's, the important part isn't so much compulsory or not, because, although it does create a lot of problems, because if it's compulsory, then you're, in a sense, you are uh, no longer respecting what are the rules of the game uh, in terms of collect free collective bargaining and so on. Uh, you, in a sense, you have to repeal it for the period of whatever it would be, right? So that creates a lot of havoc, you know, in terms of conflict, legal, you know, problems with trade unions usually, as, as in fact it did happen, I could say that. But even if, whether it's compulsory or, or not, in a sense, whether it's just guideposts, they had to justify them usually on the basis of income distributional grounds. And that's very important, okay? That is to say that when you set some number, okay, some numerical value, okay, let's say for wage growth, okay, which you're hoping, given the way firms set you know, prices uh, according to some sort of markup rule and all that, okay, would then also lead to a certain inflation rate. Okay? The idea behind that was normally that they would be setting these wage targets in a way that would ultimately Okay? be distributionally neutral. At least you don't want it to be biased one way or the other. Okay? And that's very important. Okay? They were justified on that basis, which normally meant that you wished, of course, that real wages ought to be growing with productivity growth, some sort of you know, indicator of that, okay? as, a, as a way to justify the kind of distribution and neutrality. Well, what we see in the context of the inflation targeting regimes is the complete disappearance of that discussion. Okay? And indeed, the research that we've been doing that has been funded by INED, by the way, uh, on this issue of uh, central bank behavior and central bank uh, policies here and income distribution, because that's exactly the issue that arises. Okay? As I was saying earlier, when they uh, have to achieve a certain target goal, they're going to use the stick, so to speak, here. So whenever they see the inflation rate inching up somewhat, so to speak, as you know, they will then start raising interest rates, okay? Which, as we could see here, what it does, it, it could raise, Okay, if those interest, real interest rates there go up as a, in the process as well, they could raise and, or, or they could stabilize, depending on how they do it here. I mean, we could get into the whole nitty gritty of this here. But what it does, it clearly stabilizes, and at least it stabilizes, rentier type incomes, you know, you know, interest income, while in a sense sort of destabilizing, if you wish, uh, wage income you know, labor market incomes. And if you look at the evidence of this, I've, we've looked at stuff on that. We've looked at the, the actual evolution of income distribution, okay, by these factor shares, for instance. And it's very obvious, okay, that when these regimes came into place, starting in the early 1990s, like in the case of Canada, it was the second after New Zealand uh, in 1991. We had, in February 1991, we adopted inflation targeting. And there are about maybe 30 countries now that at least are doing uh, this sort of inflation targeting, you know, officially. Uh, although, indeed, you know, and the U.S. is another example now, but some would argue that they were already implicitly doing that even before they were officially doing that. You know, so in a sense, it doesn't really matter. You could argue to what extent they were officially inflation targeting versus, in fact, being obsessed or being primarily concerned with the inflation rate over above any other sort of macroeconomic variable out there. But the whole point was that, as I said, which is that when you see these inflation targeting regimes being set up, what you also find is indeed that the share of labor is declining throughout, okay, which of course is interesting. 
because it shows that they never got, became concerned directly with the, in, the income distributional issues that had to be justified in, when they were, you know, in the earlier times in fighting inflation through income policies, okay? Uh, no longer that became an issue, and therefore the consequences, obviously, as, as a simple example here, if indeed they do take it seriously, let's say the trade unions do follow the rule here of saying if it's a 2% goal, let's say the inflation rate, which is the usual numerical value, by the way, that you find. So if it's a 2% rule, okay, and if wages do grow at 2%, it means, of course, if there's uh, growth, you know, at the same time, then you're going to have this uh, problem of, uh, you know, a share of labor being uh, squeezed to some extent as a, as a result of that. And this is why uh, we, uh, this is the kind of evidence that we find there. But what is interesting here is how could it happen that a central bank that has that as the mandate all of a sudden focuses on one thing called the inflation rate? Well, I th there, t there are a number of aspects to this uh, that I, one can perhaps uh, explain why this happens. But let me just first say that it has to be approved by the government, first thing. So this is a kind of legal thing. It's literally, as it's every five years, okay, they renew the mandate. They tried even to, there was a time there was a debate over revising our constitution, literally, in Canada, in the early 1990s, and they were attempting to uh, change altogether and to put it into the constitution that the central bank ought, ought to have a sole goal as combating inflation, okay? Uh, that didn't fly, it didn't work, the whole thing. But what happened instead was that every five years now, at the time of the budget, when the Minister of Finance introduces the budget for the year, every fifth year they also include a uh, clause there, if you wish, that has to be voted by Parliament in renewing the mandate you know, of, the, of the Central Bank, in the, in the case of Canada, Bank of Canada. And so there's a kind of legal side to this, so it has to be approved by the government. There has to be some sort of coordination, if you wish. You know, it cannot just be the bank, which is, in a sense, it's we actually, in our case, is not an independent central bank, officially, as some are, like the Bank of England, let's say, and so on, or even the U.S. case. We have, uh, it's an arm, it's, not, it's arm's length, yes, but it's still an arm of the state, so to speak. Okay? Uh, but that's a detail in terms of independence, non-independence, I think. It's really a bit of a, uh, what would I call it, a red herring kind of issue. And I, it's not that important issue. But I, just to say that, in our case, we have that. What, what happens there, and this is the key, is how do they justify that they, the central bank's ultimate goal ought to be the inflation rate? And this comes from economic theory. Okay? In what sense? If you start from the premise that the economy tends to gravitate around some natural level of unemployment or natural growth rate, okay, uh, then what you want to do is achieve that optimal level of inflation that would be associated with that. So in a sense, whatever unemployment is there, if you act on it irresponsibly, so to speak, Okay? It will lead to destabilizing you know, the price level or, or the inflation rate. And so if you're in that kind of box, if you wish to call that, let's say the Nehru box, or to use a terminology here, uh, then of course the conclusion is that uh, other goals are in a sense just part of the same thing. So if you're achieving that optimal level of inflation rate, okay, then, of course, it will do the following. You will be at the optimal path in terms of unemployment and output growth. And indeed, even more importantly, and, and, and the Bank of Canada in particular, in our case, has played an important role in these justifications. There's a whole literature on that that we've uh, looked at, okay, where it also leads to the highest growth in terms of productivity or welfare for the nation. In other words, a level of inflation that is optimal, so to speak, in the sense of achieving that goal, is also the one that will be associated with the highest growth in productivity. Now, the, so the question, of course, is that 
Is there any evidence of that? Well, we've looked at that and there's, there's none, except that it was for a long time repeated. Okay? Now, and I'll tell you why it's important. There were two Bank of Canada economists in 1982 that published a paper okay, that has been cited over and over and over okay, uh, in the Review of Economics and Statistics, where they found, by looking at data, especially pertaining to the 1970s, they had done some, some interesting empirical work at the time, sh showing how, in fact, there was a negative relationship between inflation and productivity growth. So as you get the inflation rate back down to some sort of optimal level or zero or whatever it might be or close to that, or 2%, which is the goal right now, okay, that will get that, you know, the, the economy will work more efficiently. It will be therefore, okay, uh, achieving that highest optimal level of growth and productivity especially in terms of economic welfare. Uh, but that was based on evidence during a short period of the 1970s when, as you know, this was a period of the oil price shocks where inflation went up, but at the same time as these economies were slowing down, therefore the productivity is go you know, growth was going down. And the causality here, of course, we could debate exactly what was going on there. Okay? But that dominated the discussions at the time in the 80s, and they used that all the time now, they don't talk about it anymore today because, I mean, after, you know, let's say, almost 40 years here, we are uh, still, uh, we look at the, the situation, let's say, and we, there's no evidence of it, in fact. Okay? But for a very long time, they repeated that. But they still have it as an act of, let's say, let's call it a faith, you know, that uh, somehow, if we achieve that optimal level of inflation, the economy will work most efficiently that way. In actual fact, especially since uh, the financial crisis. Uh, if you look at the experience like we've had in our, in our country, in Canada in particular, and I, I would say that more generally as well, but especially in Canada, okay, uh, uh, not only because I know it better, but because they really did show a certain degree of what I would call pragmatism here. Okay? In other words, uh, we had a, a, w what really happened as a result of the financial crisis? is that while they still paid lip service to inflation targeting, okay? I mean, they still say that they're doing it. In actual fact, the evidence in terms of the actual reaction functions, if you sort of model that and try to see how exactly, you know, we, we looked at that, uh, you will see that they're not doing that, or certainly not doing that alone. Not at all, I would argue, okay? So what happened, in, in fact, was that it, if you take Canada, okay, when you look at interest rates okay, uh, and the inflation rate, in our case, the inflation rate, you know, we didn't have as deep crises as in the United States. We were not affected as badly. Okay? We had an increase in the unemployment rate. It went up from like 5 6 to 8% approximately, but not to the rate that, uh, the, well, not the big jump that we see in the United States. So we weren't as badly affected or, you know, by, by the crisis, you could argue. But still, okay, what happened there was that the inflation rate barely budged through that whole period. It's still around 2%, maybe 1.5%, you know, two. it didn't really change very much, but interest rates plummeted completely. Now you ask yourself, what's going on here? How is it that the central bank that controls the overnight rate, okay, it, they brought it down to virtually zero, I mean it was point, 0.25, let's say it hit as bottom, let's say in 2009, 2010 and so on. Now why was it that they were doing that? Obviously it wasn't because they were trying to achieve uh, the inflation rate, right? Because it was pretty stable, interestingly enough, okay? But instead, Obviously, what they were concerned about was the crisis. You know, they were concerned about un problems of unemployment and so on. And, and indeed, also more importantly than unemployment, debt levels. Okay? Because obviously, in, in, like in our case, where you have consumer you know, debt or household debt being you know, almost you know, at, the rec well, at record levels, for sure, if we still do, then if you raise interest rates too much or if you do something that could 
change that, you know, uh, can really create problems. And therefore, in this case, when they were bringing it down, was of course to avoid that there will be any collapse, especially in the, you know, in sectors like in the housing market and so on, that could be, create real problems.